Welcome. Oops. I'm losing my microphone already. Excuse me. Okay. I may just have to sit like this for the next 20 minutes. Need um, help? Hang on a minute. Sorry about that, guys. Um, it's a great privilege. Welcome, Cameron. Uh, it's a great privilege to get the chance to hear from one of the most uh, distinguished and thoughtful of American journalists. Cameron has had a, uh, an extraordinarily um, distinguished career, both as a reporter and as an editor. He covered almost every corner of the world, notably the Middle East and, and Asia for many years, and latterly has been, uh, as an editor, uh, guiding through some of the biggest stories at the Washington Post over the last uh, five, ten years, including um, the Snowden revelations and the devastating expose that the Post did on the Secret Service. And it's particularly good to talk to him now because the Post uh, is at the vanguard, really, of covering the Trump presidency or or possibly assailing the Trump presidency with fake news, depending on which side you're watching from. So, Cameron, let's... Thank you. Thank God. It's... it's uh... Okay. Um, let's plunge straight in uh, to the fate of facts. Um, yeah. I think there are quite a few people now who are quite gloomy about facts. They look at the speed and ease with which fake news, conspiracy theories uh, can spread. They look at collapsing levels of trust in the media, and they think things look pretty grim. And on the other hand, uh, there is this sense that journalism in particular has never been more important. Right. Is this the best of times or the worst of times for well, people who care about facts? Ian, let me, let me make the case for optimism. Uh, and I, I would point to two things first. One is that we've seen in the United States, especially since uh, the presidential campaign, a huge surge in people's willingness to pay for quality news, right? Uh, the New York Times has something like three million digital subscribers. Uh, we have one million. Uh, we're you know, trying to get to two as quickly as we can. Um, so I think that there's been a, a growing recognition that content quality content isn't free, and people are willing to act on that. So that's very encouraging. I would also say that some of the giant platforms operated by tech companies that don't want to be identified as media companies or as publishers, they're starting to rethink their position too, and so are governments, right? That those companies actually have a responsibility to at least be more transparent in what the content is, right? Is it a political ad that's purchased by someone with a, with a stake in the election? Shouldn't that be transparent to people on social media? So I see, you know, in both of these realms, I think you can find encouraging news for people being more discerning about the facts that they consume. Um, and you see a growing willingness on the part of some publishers to, to present that. Okay, well, l l let me put a bit of a pessimistic case uh, then. Your paper has uh, had a series of really significant revelations about different aspects, well, even about Trump as a candidate, some of those uh, uh, revelations about his behavior towards women, latterly about the relationship between members of administration and uh, or the contacts with the Russians. Does it worry you that almost anything that you reveal will be dismissed by around half of America as a piece of partisanship? You know, I don't worry too much about that. I, I find the term fake news to be a broad brush accusation. You know, we've seen time and again that when news organizations publish actual facts, uh, the administration has to react to those facts because they're true. Uh, so, you know, th th that broad term doesn't make me too, too anxious. I would also point you to, um, you know, just the, the recent political climate in the United States where, you know, just yesterday a Democratic candidate for governor in the state of Virginia uh, defeated the Republican by nine points, right? So compare that with the presidential result where Hillary defeated uh, Donald Trump by five points. So that shows you a little bit of a margin uh, in favor of the Democrats. Another good data point on this subject is that in a recent poll we did with ABC News, uh, two-thirds of Americans think that one year after the election, 
the Trump administration has accomplished either not much or nothing. So, you know, that, that also tells me that um, the reporting matters, right? That, that journalism breaks through and that people then respond to that. So, so you don't worry that the constant Trump assault on newspapers, news organizations like yours, the allegation constantly wheeled out that you're peddling fake news is actually gradually eroding uh, confidence in news organizations. And, and I would say, shouldn't you be looking at some of the people that he's hung nicknames around the necks of already and dispatched with pretty effectively? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> look, you're never going to win over all the people all the time. Uh, you know, I'd go back to my earlier point. We see a growing number of people not willing to just believe what we say, but they're willing to pay for what we produce. Right? That's a very concrete expression of someone's trust in an organization. Um, and that's a much different model for us than the one we used to operate under, which was advertising-based. Um, and it, that's a really, really encouraging thing. Politicians have all, always adopted, you know, grandiose rhetoric of one kind or another to try to advance their cause. You know, our job is really to put our heads down plow through that, do our jobs right, which is, you know, frankly, to do the reporting, to tell the people what's really going on, and, and then not worry about what the rhetoric is. So it's really heartening to hear from you and others that subscriptions have gone up and people are prepared to put their money, as it were, where their mouth is. But I've also read lots of uh, results of surveys in the States that show that trust in the media more broadly is way down. I mean, there was a, Har a Harvard-Harris poll earlier this year, which I'm sure you uh, saw, which had 65% of voters saying they believed there was a lot of fake news in the mainstream media, and 80%, 80% of Republicans saying they thought there was fake right. news in the mainstream media. That's you know, got to be worrying, right? I agree with you. Deeply troubling, right? But uh, we, we all operate in discrete organizations, right? Uh, the, the media is kind of a, that's an umbrella term that's not all that. I find it's not all that relevant to what I do, right? I, I encourage reporters and editors to go after stories that actually tell us something that we didn't already know. Um, we, we put that out there with as much factual accuracy as we can muster, um, and we find that you know readers respond to that. I was on an earlier panel today, which was called uh, Veracity and Virality, and I thought it was actually pretty, a pretty good name, because what we find is that veracity produces virality. Um, and when we do a scoop or something that's truly revelatory about this administration or others, people really, really respond to that. So while I accept that those broad surveys tell us something dispiriting about the media, I think for individual organizations, we are accountable to ourselves, to our readers, and we just have to keep doing it. Can you tell me a little bit about <clears throat> how, as an organization, you go about covering the Trump administration. Is, it, is this just another uh, political administration, albeit painted in, in more primary colors, or is this a, a, a unique journalistic challenge that demands a different kind of response? Well, the answer to that is yes and no. I mean, we cover this administration with the same sense of mission and focus we've covered previous administrations. Um, I, I think the president in this case has set a different tone, right, in all of this vilification of fake news or journalists as dishonest people or as lying people, uh, you know, that makes, it, that, that makes it unique in some ways, right? We haven't had to contend with that before. Mm. Um, but uh, look, our jobs are the same, right? Our jobs are to go and, you know, I, I have this sort of clumsy but effective definition of reporting that I use with reporters, which is reporting is previously undisclosed fact that's relevant to the public debate that some powerful institution or person wishes to keep secret. Now, sometimes you don't have the third element of that and you still have a great story, but when you have those three elements, you really have a powerful story that I think breaks through the idea of fake news because it's demonstrable, right? It's a fact. People have to react to that. And, you know, we've seen that time and again from the Trump administration when, you know, the Trump administration has had to react to our reporting. Um, yeah. You know, a, a recent example is that we demonstrated that the man whom Trump had nominated to be the, the U.S. drug czar uh, had earlier backed, actually sponsored a bill in Congress that had the effect of, of kind of hobbling the drug 
Admin uh, Enforcement Administration. And after we did that story, which we did in partnership with 60 Minutes, um, that man is no longer the, the nominee. So as much vilification and rhetoric as is out there, we also see time and again that reporting makes a difference. Um, it makes a difference for the administration. They must contend with it. Uh, and, th and that's why I'm fundamentally optimistic about you know, where our industry is now and, and what news organizations can accomplish. You say they, they must contend with the facts, but of course, Donald Trump himself memorably said, I could walk out in the campaign, didn't he? He said, he said I could walk out into Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and there wouldn't be any consequences. Does that, I mean, do you think that there is a sense of invulnerability to the normal laws of uh, fact-based journalism in this White House that they think that they can sort of cut loose from the laws of gravity that have applied? Well, as to the Fifth Avenue line, I would like to see him try that. And we'll see if it has consequences or not. Um, you know, to the, to I think your, your deeper point, um, look, we've had, um, you know, kind of behind the scenes conversations with the White House that I think put the lie to the idea that they don't care about what the facts are. And one good example of that is that we reported that um, President Trump had called the family of a soldier who'd been killed in Afghanistan, and he was moved by the man's um, sorrow, and President Trump promised him a $25,000 check of his own. And um, so we, some weeks later, we contacted that grieving father, and he told us that he'd received a letter from the White House, but no check. And so we were on the verge of reporting that, and uh, we called the White House for comment. And uh, they pleaded with us not to report the story. And we said, well, why? You know, I mean, we said, no, we're going to report the story um, because that's what we do. And it, but it always strikes me, and this is not the only instance where the White House has asked us to keep back information that is problematic for them. Um, and, 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 you know, I said in one case to a, on a different matter to a, a White House official, look, we're in this age of where you say that what we do is fake news and you're asking us to withhold information that we think is relevant. We're not going to do that. So, uh, as I say, in spite of the rhetoric, I think we have evidence time and time again that, you know, the facts do matter. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, the, uh, they matter just as much for this White House as for any other. And, and certainly in, you know, the election results, that one of which we saw yesterday and another big round we'll see in a year, uh, we'll see how much voters absorb that information. Yeah. Okay, let, let me be the pessimist again. Um, sure. Some people would say, I think, that it's not surprising that you are pretty uh, cheery about the state of journalism um, because uh, you are lucky enough to have the world's richest man bankrolling your sure. news organization. Uh, but for the rest of the industry, uh, the brute reality is that a lot of the people in this hall uh, have helped to destroy the business model of news organizations and that the focus on fake news and so on that's not where the real problem is. The real problem is that news organizations can't pay the bills anymore, and that is a real catastrophe for facts. No doubt. Uh, um, obviously, a hugely challenging time for many organizations. You know, we do have an advantage, so do some other American news organizations, that where we could cultivate a national and even an international audience for our work. Um, one of the problematic areas in the United States is sort of the regional news organization, right? The news organization that covers a big city and maybe the surrounding states. There's some optimistic signs from some of those organizations that are also constructing that direct relationship between reader and news organization, um, which I think is really the path, certainly the path forward for us. We put putting a lot of emphasis now on subscriptions, um, and that may be a promising path forward for smaller organizations that can cultivate, you know, a loyal reader base in a, you know, in, in a large city and, and, and surrounding states. So I wouldn't be, I don't want to be always the optimist, but I'm also a little bit encouraged by that. Um, you know, at a larger level, I think the great lesson for us 
from sort of this campaign forward is kind of the power of investigative journalism uh, in, in kind of basically telling people what they didn't already know uh, and doing that in innovative and, you know, and digital ways. One of my colleagues is a reporter named David Farenthold who did a lot of reporting about uh, Trump's charitable giving or, or non, not giving, as it was often the case. Um, and, you know, in one f famous, for us anyway, famous instance, you know, he was trying to determine where a, a particular portrait was hanging um, because the portrait had been pur purchased with charitable money and the laws in the U.S. say that you can't use that for private benefit. So he was trying to identify where in the world this portrait was and he basically did that through Twitter. You know, he, first of all, he put on um, Twitter an image of the portrait Someone, uh, one of his followers, then basically went through TripAdvisor for a whole bunch of Trump properties and identified that this portrait was hanging in a, in a Trump club. And so, so the next step was for David to then relay that bit of information to his growing Twitter followers, one of whom is a, a journalist by the name of Enrique Acevedo, who is an anchor at Univision in Miami. And so the, the TripAdvisor reader had determined that it was in a Miami uh, Trump club. And so en Enrique then, uh, he, he, I think he was a member of the club. He checks in to spend the night. Uh, he gets there late after work. He says to the cleaners, you know, he has the portrait on his phone. He says to the cleaners, hey, has anyone seen this? A and one of them was like, well, yeah, it's hanging in the bar downstairs. So bingo, that was the story, right? And that, you know, that's always, this is sort of a marvel to me in our age, you know, we have a lot of sense of turmoil and peril about where we are, but that, you know, that's UGC investigative journalism. You, you can't imagine that kind of reporting taking place ever before. And that's what this moment in, you know, our industry's disruption offers but us. That's a, that's a great story to end on because for me, it captures all the promise that journalists like us felt uh, there was in the whole idea of citizen journalism and collaborative journalism. And, and I was a journalist at The Guardian for many years where we had a number of similar breakthroughs in stories through collaborative working on social media. And it seemed like the internet was going to take us to a world where we knew more and we, we found out more stuff that people didn't want us to know. Fake news has sort of rolled back the, um, the curtain a bit on that. And I just want to ask you finally, do you feel now, after 20 years of the internet, you've been a, a, a reporter, a journalist for probably not 30, 30 years. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel after 20 years of the internet, we have more or less access to the truth? We know more or less about what's going on? I, I would say unequivocally more. Um, and our Despite all the stuff out there that's false. Well, I mean, and, and our capacity to relay that information to readers in, in interesting and, and very transparent ways has certainly increased, right? We can put up documents, images. We can give people access to the information in a variety of formats we never had before. Um, and, and also our ways of contacting sources and of leveraging the power of the technology to do the reporting has, as I think, maximized our power to do the work. I feel we could talk for another hour, but our time is up. Thank you very much for Thank a fascinating you. chat. Thank, Thank you for coming. You.